Hi, it's, um, my name is Igor. I, I, I'm really happy that I can come here. Uh, and I very much would like to thank you for the invitation. I, I normally do not prepare my talks today. I did prepare it and even wrote it down, which makes me very stressed. And so I'll just maybe not look at my notes and try to carry on, you know, speaking on this topic. It's a very different take than most talks I think you would hear today. I decided to go a little bit broader and make a certain reflection after writing two books, as you said, on you know, very much focused on the province. I mean, I kept Sichuan in my focus, but, you know, maybe some kind of other event in life would have put me to study Shanxi province or Hebei or any other province. So the big question comes, it's kind of a theoretical quandary, really. Um, you know, why would you we even want to research Chinese provinces to start with, or even think of kind of a provincial space, something that we might want to research? And, you know, what kind of problems are there? Because, you know, it might seem like a great topic. I'll write a book about Sichuan. But I would rather say, you know, think twice. So think even more. And so for the next, let's say, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I'll talk about it. And, you know, we are very much, you know, justified in being annoyed at much what is doing and what is happening within any scholarship on, on Earth. I mean, that is a function of historians or anthropologists, archaeologists, or any other, you know, decent humanistic uh, endeavors that we shouldn't be very much satisfied as what we find there on the shelves and try to find new questions how to go forward and you know and we're quite and we could quite justly say that in Chinese studies we can be annoyed with this China you know a notion of a country that we can just study that is very large geographically the immense population and so once we you know pick our case studies and say well this is book about China you know, it sounds a little bit ridiculous, you know, when you face, you know, if you study Qing Dynasty, some, you know, 450 million people, if you study something, you know, pertaining to today's era, 1.4 billion people and, you know, very large uh, area. So that's problems really stays in front of us. You know, we, we the, this name China appearing in all the books might, you know, really just mislead us into thinking that, you know, in fact, this book is not about China, it's about some little aspect. So should we really just sort of have this flag all, all along in there? And, you know, but there's so many books that say that. Other thing that, uh, you know, whenever you pick a book published in the People's Republic of China, and if you notice, every title starts from Tungguo, ta 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 yes? So, you know, but this, this book's really, you know, about this, you know, is it really that Tungguo? So he said, you know, what, what is the fallacy here? It's a very large fallacy because it makes us think that, you know, and again, the set of case studies are actually representing China. And if you notice that, you know, you, if you try to map them geographically, you would find very fast that they speak about a fairly limited set of regions, a fairly limited set of problems that then get authority of having a Chung Wu on the top of it and representing a whole China. But does it really? And uh, so other thing is that, you know, this China is being very much reified. So just continuing on this topic, you know, if we very much look at these studies, where the case studies come from, they come usually from certain geographical regions. We have much more studies coming from Jiangnan. We have plenty of studies about Shanghai and Beijing. But once you start going into a good research library in China studies, you suddenly realize that by the shelves about Yunnan or Sichuan or, I don't know, Gansu, that, you know, there's just first few books in there, many of them dusty, and nobody writes it. So the big China, whether it would appear in the Western language studies or in Chinese language studies, so more often than not, are regional studies or sets of case studies that then get stretched very much to cover the real China. But they don't really do the job. So I think as historians, we should, historians or other, you know, branches of humanities, we should be very much aware that perhaps we're dealing here with a grand uh, problem. The problem that what is China? Can we really study it? And what is the take we can, you know, have, you know, or at least some kind of a decent method, method into dealing with the size of a topic that we are actually truthful to our case studies. And what they would carry on it is just, telling you about one fairly attractive, perhaps, way of doing it and telling you what kind of problems we have with it. So, you know, province. What is an easy, beautiful exit? You know, well, I don't want to study China. I would then pick Sichuan. So here we have a lot of people who like Sichuan, but I would pick, I don't know, Hebei or I mean Hubei. You know, why not? You know, just we got our beautiful provinces and here we're happy. Well, there is a number of fundamental fallacies that come in the game, which I would like to make you aware of. 
And one of the first one is, well, you know, provinces just look like something else. How do they look like? Like European nation states. They have pretty much the same sizes. They have these beautifully demarcated borders. Very often, they have a nice center, a capital. Oh, we're home, yes? We have a capital, we have province, we have borders. They're even nice, neat mountains very often all around. The main river passes. God, we're like in Germany, England, France, Poland, Italy. Oh, we're home, yes? Now, we can do basically a national history, but doing the provincial history, then we are on the top, and we're all done. Well, you know, this is pretty much the worst thing that we can potentially do. And the first, you know, problem with it is the European nation states and their histories. I mean, what are European nation histories? It's something what we are combating against for the last 30, 40 odd years. We're trying to destroy the national histories. We're waging, you know, sometimes won, sometimes lost war against educational ministries to throw away all those useless books that, you know, make children learn the national history. We're in the forest of the fight against a demon that appeared in the mid 19th century in a very, very, you know, odd, but kind of how monstrous historiographic tradition that basically clipped off a certain political entities from the context of what was European history. Now then reified a set of heroes or events as being unique and then made, us nation, made our national histories. But our national histories are really aberration of writing history. Yes? They are what history shouldn't be. And most of, more often than not, they're distorting entirely our ability to actually comprehend any historical process or any process whatsoever, yes? Whether it would be related to migrations, lives, only social, political, or cultural event that happens in Europe. Now, do we really want to copy it to China May we might rather think twice. Um, well, you know, but that's is sometimes that is happening. I mean, how many of you have seen those new, beautifully published? I don't know the seven volume Sichuan history, whatever volume Yunnan histories, or beautiful, or large, or full of information. All of them you find in libraries, you know, about Chinese studies, which means we are basically within a process of replicating the same. Yes, the same process for writing local history in a very different political context. Um, other what is connected to this philosophy is the repetition. Now, you know, once you have it in China, and you're all conscious about this cultural drill of everything. Yes, there is the opera drill, there is the, I don't know, whatever, minority, any, any area has its own gazetteers, multi-volume gazetteers. And many, and all of you probably know that read them, that if you get by the border areas, you appear, there appear only repetitions, yes? The Yunnan to Sichuan, the Sichuan to Hubei. You know, once you get there, you just repeat the same context, content about culture, about developments, about politics, about whatever else, because that's creating the pseudo-national provincial histories, simply doubles the information, but then distorts the real connection between the people, something which we always know. If people cross the borders, they don't care about administrative borders if they're not prohibited to do so, yes? So the production of this kind of sources, again, as in case of national histories in Europe, or in case comes from a certain political arrangement over space and over living people to which you just enforce certain units and double on information which without any logical connection to one another. Um, the other thing that goes on with this is the idea of, well, you know, Okay, so we say, well, provinces make no sense. This is a point made ages ago, you know, they're none of the unit. I mean, this is the point made a long time ago by Mark Elvin in the Historical Atlas of China, a publication from mid-1980s. He said, well, you know, Chinese provinces simply are just administrative units. Yes, they've been just created there and they have no history. There is nothing natural about them. Yes, as if there was something natural about European nation states or any other states. But, you know, so this kind of Elvin's point is extremely radical, but we should always keep it in mind, you know, maybe not as a point, but as a question, yes? We should question the kind of spaces we are discussing. And, uh, well, you know, and are Chinese provinces anything natural? Well, you know, yes and no. Many of them exist for around 500 years. Most of them came out during the UN dynasty in a bit of a different settings. Yes, they by themselves, so they have a very long history. They did exist as a certain socioeconomic entities. They did exist as a political bodies. It, you know, 
changeable political bodies historically, but we can say that for these 500 years, some, most of the provinces do exist on the map and represent some kind of organization of the society in question. So are they a natural organization? Well, nothing is a natural organization in case of human existence. So we can just you know brush this point aside. Mm. Now, you know, looking at this, however, uh, let me have a seat. What is more important than thinking about provinces as just kind of entities, it's thinking how deep does it go in the more interactive way. So if we talk about this unit that exists for 500 years, we should not think about that they formulate a certain entities, but how do they glue with other units that are underneath? were the functionally uh, existing forms of social organizations. As in short, how did they relate to other forms of government, methods of marketing, circulation goods of people, and so on and so forth. If that thing occurs, then we can actually already identify that this sort of unit exists. And you know, if you look at China, you know, some of them did, some of them not. Some are more centric, some are less centric. If you think about Hubei, you know, everything comes out to the one confluence of Han River and the Yangtze River. But if you're looking up toward Guangzhou, you would see that there are very separate spots that are going out. There's a Guangdong province, yeah? So there's a Guangzhou, there's Shantou, and so on. So each of them face and have a basically independent self-existence. So, you know, the diversity should be our key. Um, and the last thing is that, you know, many of these provinces uh, in China changed their populations over these 500 years. And in case of, you know, some of them, have been entirely destroyed. I mean, if you think a lot of people here study Sichuan, so 92% of population lost to the UN dynasty, again, 70% loss during the Minchin transition. I mean, but this is a story that's quite repetitive, not only just massacres, death, epidemics, whatever else, you know, you mentioned, but also migration, in-migration, out-migration, uh, you know, large changes of population, large ecological transformation over this period. All of them impact very much uh, how it or work. And, you know, the last fallacy that comes to my mind, obviously, when talking about it, is the fallacy of more even of the ethnicity. You know, we have this notion, which we talked about Nathan a second ago, so Chu Hua Min Zhu, yeah, so the Chinese, the notion of Chinese nation gets smiles on the faces. Um, but, you know, that gives a sense of ethnic unity, which is supposed to exist 5,000 years, though I'm, I'm not updated, maybe now 6,000 years, you know, you never know, longer and longer in history. Um, but then again, you know, we get to a certain problem of historicity of ethnicity and historicity of identities and culture, which obviously do not correspond to any of the geographical or political geographical units. Yes, I mean, as historians, we see the transition through the past and obviously any such notion would just distort our vision. That's why what I think is that once we go and look into research and history, we should be more people centric and much less geography centric. Us. And our history should be closer. That sounds like a, like a good old, you know, Maoism, but, you know, people, we should focus on the people, yes? People as groups and interactions, as networks they build, as how they migrate, how they interact with other human units. So we, even though very often our sources are very disappointing, then the way we look at history should really very much keep in person a, an existing human being and not some kind of a geographical abstract. So now, once we start looking more to people, we need to start defining also what we mean by the province. As we said, the province is a very problematic thing. You know, we talk about geographical provinces, but that's not necess you know, necessary. Province uh, can sometimes mean a hinterland. Yes? Province, in a more colloquial word, means just a place that it not belongs to the center. Yes? So it can be an administrative entity as exists in China on the word of Shen but it can be just simply a hinterland of the city. It can be the place that is remote or is a place that exists in some kind of relationship between center and periphery, where periphery whether for perspective of economy, whether perspective of social exchanges or in migration. But when you come to China, we always have to be also somehow uh, synthesized to the notion that the province as we use it in English is not a Chinese notion. Yes, our notion of province and this is what somehow is very often missing up from scholarly discussion 
that you know a lot of discussion in many areas, not only related to China studies, but also to global history and so on. That when we talk about province and provinciality, we very often forget of the very Roman roots of this world, and we largely think of Roman settler colonialism to places like today's um, Provence, which has its name in the south of south of France, or Sicily, or what they called Africa, which in today's is Tunisia. Yes, so kind of forms of settler colonialism organized by the Roman Empire, which meant, and what is more important, its roots, it's somehow its definition. It was a transplantation of a certain legal and social uh, organization from the Rome, from Latium, to the provinces, to the outlying areas within the empire, which means copying the center to the peripheries. Now, once we speak about Chinese provinces or any provincial spaces, I don't think we could talk of this kind of provinces, of transplantations of a core to the periphery. We rather think of a certain means of controlling the outlying elements of the empire. As Chinese provinces come out largely from the mechanism of extending control over the conquered and controlled land within the empires. And only in time, they deepen up the mechanisms in which simply the center obtains its own mechanisms of control, safeguarding border, transferring taxes, and creating a fairly similar ritual, social, cultural order which unites the elites within one sp imperial space. So that is quite a large difference than the settler colonialism which existed in the Mediterranean world during the Roman times. Um, other thing is that we should look at the province as a, in the kind of human to human network so about the interactions that leads to institutionalization of what is uh, a province and how these institutions shape the people so we're talking about transferring of institutions you know stories like Hui Guan in China yes? so movement of a certain institutions both inside and outside to the capital and building identities and building the provincial spaces and redefining them through interactions among people and social groups through forms of institutions. And we also should look at provinces, not exactly it's just this administrative means of things on the map, but also as forms of networks, connections, travel, transfers, exchanges, and so on within variety of fields, whether there will be work, whether there will be knowledge, whether that will be music, performers, genres, objects, whatever else you name. Yes. So we have to look, if we want to look at people in the center of our scholarship, we don't have to start looking at the way the people actually organize their own society, produce their interactions, produce their networks, produce the memories of it, produce certain scapes, whether they'll be cityscapes, whether they'll be temple spaces, whether they will be religious cults, and whatsoever. So thus, when we think of a province, really, we should go broader than administration. We should think of a space of interaction, of complex production that happens within the historical time. And, uh, and there is no uniformity. Yes, this is really how it just developed. And there is no simple system then of saying, well, you know, we just study provinces and it's easy. We just line up our histories as we have it everywhere. I, I looked at it again at my um, Sichuan, seven volume Sichuan history, you know, shouldn't do that. You know, pre Qin, during Qin, Han, and so on. Does that really correspond in the way the networks, the organizations, the life, within these provinces have been built. No, it rather ignores the kind of interactions that produce real historical results in the place by uniformizing and linking the history to the big national past that is not built on the basis, the notion of this past, on the basis ever derived from the place like Sichuan province or any other province. Yeah? So in fact, at least in my opinion, we should have an ambition of building it up from the local sets of interactions. And uh, at the same time, you know, it doesn't make any sense to think of provinces as something independent. Huh? So thinking of them as some kind of independent ethnic, you know, pseudo nation states. So replicating the mistakes of the times of the nations of, of, of national histories in which we cut off interactions in order to write for something unique. And, you know, I will later on, just, just in a minute, provide you some examples how little sense it makes. But... Uh, uh, but that, that's it. Okay. Um, why is it so important? Well, because we want our histories to be relevant. Yes. So not only relatively true, 
and touching at least with a historical truth that we can derive from sources if something like this exists. But we also want to be able to examine the questions and want to examine the developments that happened in history. And the only way to do it is by localizing it. And only by localizing it, we can do it by looking at this broadly conceived idea of, of a province, whether it can be. Um, that means that, well, perhaps we shouldn't, <laughs> it doesn't mean that we have to do micro histories though. Yeah, micro history is not the solution, not so easy. Or what they called historical anthropology. There was the macro type. For China, it was called historical anthropology in China because of David Farr, you know, and the way, you know, the grant authorities in Hong Kong work. For us, you know, we're really talking here about micro histories. We shouldn't jump into micro history thinking that we got a golden solution for everything. Micro history is historians pretending to be anthropologists, but playing with books. And, you know, it's very interesting. But at the same time, it also might end up, you know, us cutting out our little piece and our case studies and reifying it way beyond its actual meaning. Okay, um, so so many fallacies that I have listed to you in here are fallacies of repeating, you know, the bad historiographic traditions that didn't help us, the fallacies of, you know, of uh, reifying the provinces, or the ones of, you know, wrongly defined topics, or the ones of, uh, you know, the way things don't really work. Um, and as you could hear, my solution to it would be that for looking at networks in interactions. So I'll give you some examples. Let me from Sichuan. Lando. I don't know if you see it. It's this lovely city in the northern Sichuan. You know, not few, few Western tourists go there. It's mostly Sichuanese tourists travel. You know, it, it's preserved in approximately 60 something percent as it comes to its original architecture from the Ming Dynasty, from largely from the Qing Dynasty, mostly 18th century, bombed by the Japanese in a certain moment, but without large destruction. Um, certain elements have been reconstruction, not the tower, this one from which I took this picture, but this other tower has been freshly reconstructed. But largely, uh, the city stands as it is. Now, Landrong is famous for its local hero. And the local hero is jumping your rope. <laughs> it was the place where, you know, the free kingdom the hero, Zhangfei, has resided. That's where he, you know, fought, you know, large battles and proof. It's everything. And that's where is his grave, at least historically. But obviously, there comes two products that all China accessible with Zhangfei in your rope. And I, do, I lost my picture, a John Fei Pijo, which we can only consume locally. Now, apart from lovely cuisine and that thing, you know, we have an example of this hero. Now, this is a very, very particular, I give you some pictures initially, and then I talk about it. This is a very particular local cult, religious cult, around the grave of John Fei. So this is this lovely temple, you know, which you enter. It's actually very well preserved and taken care for. It has a you know, a kind of a fearsome statues of John Fay. Uh, is, you know, this is the guy that can do your Swan Ming, you know, by the side. So, you know, at least you can know something about your future, which is dire. And, you know, but you have, you know, this main, the E, yeah, so his uprightness is being, he's a giant, so, you know, a normal person sort of that high. So, uh, and another set of statues. Uh, in front of which you can, you know, take a picture of a kid with this lovely little element, as you see here, of people's hellish figures smashing your face, which is good to, for children education, as we all know. And behind it, there's this mound, which is, according to a tradition, a grave of John Fei. So John Fei stands as a local hero for Landong. It's apart from food production, beer production, whatever else, you know, it has its own forms of historical religious cult, which obviously it's not from the third century AD, but you know, stretches largely, we would say around Qing dynasty is being activated. Most of those monuments, apart obviously for the grave, that is historical uh, date somewhere from the, you know, Kanshi, Kanshi Qianlong period where the renovations of temples mostly occurred in this area. And, you know, this is something also what many people who are from outside Sichuan or even outside, you know, they Beichuan would not even hear about, whereas people in Landong and this area would very much know and identify the place. With John Fay. Now, in which way John Fay 
is a local hero or an exemplar of something like local history. If you focus on him solely and exclusively as an element of the local history, you end up in exactly in that place where you would not understand anything or actually understand everything wrongly. Yes, John Fay, you know, figure that you know relates to the very not only very broad narrative tradition history of China, but also a historical figure never born in that area, existing for a limited time, you know, whose you know very memory and existence have been produced to belong to that space, most probably through narrative tradition and its reviving and building monuments to what is a memory of the past of the past than to the actual presence of some grave. I mean, nobody ever dug up this grave. So, you know, we don't know if he actually is there or it's not there because it's quite controversial, obviously, to dig in the graves and also very problematic from the perspective of archaeological works, if you want to damage. Um, so understanding John Fay is a local, so this is exactly the place where the local meets, uh, we would call it national, or is it not national, or is it a certain cultural re realm that is you know, considered China, as where a very broader elements gets localized within a particular space where they have their own life and local impact, where we through them we can understand how this sort of very provincial reality can live and what is an element of a provincial culture that actually is very deeply embedded into the broader sets of traditions that make up what we can talk this sort of corpus of Chinese traditions. And here I'm consciously using the word of corpus instead of a word Chinese culture or Chinese civilization, which would be very French if we call it a civilization. It always helps, but you know, but a rather so the sets of elements that are not necessarily very much connected to each other, but that exist, coexist to the other, it came out to different strands of this tradition. Yes, elements in corpus don't have to be in a clear relation to one another. And that's very much, you know, at least for me, allows me very much to understand how a broad and long tradition live, can live. Yes. And so uh, obviously, then looking at John Fay, and this is not, you know, John Fay is just one example, but I could give you, you know, Du Jian Yans, you know, the story of Arlang Li Bing, yeah? so another Arlang, the famous black faced god, you know, which, you know, very ferocious, you know, here cultural hero in some way, and, you know, very much connected to Li Bing, which is the official of the Qin dynasty that created a whole dam system that divided, split rivers, and then provided irrigation to the Chengdu plain and started the Chengdu tradition. You could also use this kind of example. Yes? So Li Bing, Arlang, you know, they get mixed together, you know, with a very complex, a bit obscure cultural tradition in these very important works of empire building by the Qin dynasty. Yes, And they have both the very local faces and the one that integrate them into broader unity of the country. And I think from us as a historian, this kind of example exactly points us to the difficulty of studying provincial histories in China. But then I could leave China and start throwing you examples from European history of exactly the same quality, yes? where the networks element of history way overwhelm, in fact, the local particularity. However, nothing in human activity is not local. Yes, we only exist in one place in one time. Yeah? So we need to keep that balance as well. The second example for which I don't have picture before we move to one of the pictures is the one coming from Sichuan Opera because I spent so much time troubling myself with Sichuan Opera. It, those that know a little bit about it know that 70% of the scripts and music comes from the tradition which is called Gao Qian. Yes? Gao like five. Yes? So we can chant, we can call it as a tune, as a voice, as a set of melodies. Now, there is a very big problem with Gaoqiang, and this is the one that entirely damages much of the writing of province-centered uh, histories of opera, music, or Chinese performers or tradition or tradition in general. And one of these problems is that Gaoqiang does not originate from Sichuan. It originates from Jiangxi, borderline Anhui. It comes with the migrations uh, different migration, because so many of the opera tunes and opera tune traditions anyway, under the Yi Yang Qiang or Gao Qiang, migrate northwards and along the Yangtze westwards, as with migration of people. So we can see these Jiangxi traditions influencing both what later on in its history grew up as northern tradition of opera and later on south of it from other mixing comes Beijing opera, but Gao Qiang moves along the Yangtze with migration of people and ended up being in Sichuan. It brings with itself a set of scripts, but also a particular way of music. It's largely percussion and singing. Yes? 
it comes with also certain dialectical twists. The one that ends up in Sichuan and builds it up into Sichuan opera comes from Guam. So again, we, we already jumped three provinces, <laughs> two regions, three provinces. But it is a real somehow a story. So how local then is Gaochan to Sichuan? Well, it obviously is because it is later on, obviously in the 20th century only, it's integrated as the musical troupe started singing in different tunes, the five tunes to Sichuan opera and simply Sichuan opera troops. When Sichuan opera appeared in the early 20th century, when it commercialized, started to sing in all the five tunes. And 70% of the script was Gao Tiang. And it was much closer to the ones which is sung in Hubei and Hunan. And that's where we get to all sorts of problems. Wait, are we talking here about classifications of opera so centric as yes, the performance culture of China, to Chinese culture? Or are we, can we sweep away these provincial names and start talking about people? So let's sweep them away. And then you think of a big migration from 17, late 17th century, there flows people along the Yangtze and the population of rather depleted Hunan, Hubei areas, and later on Sichuan, get also colonized by people speaking and singing because they organize religious festivals, operas in a particular dialect. Yes, they called it Gaochang because it was high, high pitched kind of voice with a percussion. These people typically settled in Sichuan. They settled in there at the end in the villages where to, next to people who they knew. Yes, and they circulated their traditions with the growing and growing in decades and decades communities among the people they knew who could speak that kind of a language and at the same time enjoy this kind of opera, the stories related to opera and the stories to the religious cults, to the gods this opera was celebrating. And so we ended up with a horror for somebody who loves provincial stories or getting history of China cut into provinces because it's something that entirely breaks up all the borders and shows you how through language, through travel, through movement of images of culture, in fact, you have certain integrated realms along the routes of transportation and networks of people. Well, in this case, riverine networks that brought people along the Yang to repopulate Sichuan and then spread around along main rivers in the time. And so, you know, so we just crossed out particularity of religious cults, no particular culture, particularly of local dialect and tradition, out. Well, at least Sichuan has to have something if you focus on it, yes? Let's say warlords, oh, Sichuan warlords. Yes, everybody loves Sichuan warlords. Sichuan warlords mostly came from the family, from Liu family, yes? The famous Liu's of Sichuan. All of them settled in this lovely city. Da Yi is the big county. And in Da Yi, there is a small township called Anren. It's kind of south of Chengdu. If those who go to Chengdu haven't gone there, go there. You'll have fun. Now, so what's up with the Liu's? Here is the elder of the Liu's, had a modest house. Here he was, yes, Zhongxian. Yeah, he had uh, three sons. Those three sons have been slightly more fertile. So they had more sons and more sons and more. Of the most famous of them, uh, those that love is Liu Wenhui, Liu Wenzai, and their younger cousin, Liu Xiang, even though he wasn't younger by age, but it's just how it came out. Now, Liu Xiang, you're right here, yes, and you will see the arrow. Now, Liu Xiang has been the warlord of Chongqing for most of his career. He sat on the city of Chongqing like a spider on the middle of the web. And because it has the, been the main source of transporting opium, so nicely from Sichuan and so prolifically consumed all around China. So he's, you know, his purse was never empty. And now these two guys, you know, had other stories, Liu Wenzai and Liu Wenhui. Uh, and one of them became a uh, basically kind of a viceroy of Shikang and is very close to what you guys study. So Khan Shikang, where he built his own little Inya'an, his own capital and lived there happily ever after. And no, not really, because then there came a communist revolution and he deflected to the communists. Liu, uh, the previous guys, uh, Wenzai and Liu Xiang, had the happiness of dying before the communist revolution, whereas the rather, if he's actually deflected to communists in the last moment, handed up the province, became a general of the communist army, became a celebrated man, hero of China, and died in 1976 in a hospital, 76 or 70, I don't remember, in a hospital in Beijing, 
of old age after splendid career on top positions, well, meaningless, but top positions within the People's Republic. He never lost his crown. Now, the family, as you cannot see, it is largely conceived on that bed, was all, the, all these large children. And so the first of them, uh, the, the one who was ruler of Tibet, it has this very lovely villa. So just the first I show a picture and I tell you what I want to tell about him. So it is he being a Wenhui, yes, Yo Wenhui, the, the one of Shikang. He, uh, he had this lovely palace with beautiful classical and neoclassical and kind of 1930s China mix things. There's even his sculpture sitting with his wife and happily watching opera being played for them as they entertain themselves. He had this double room, so one room, then just one next to another, has elements of a traditional Chinese household where he consulted on important issues and in order to take care of the motherland here, sure, and in other on the couch, he was sitting under the shining star of the chairman, Mao. And now the other villas, the, this is the ones belonging, as far as I remember, to uh, Yu Xiang, who was slightly more modest. and. This and this one, when you enter along to the evil Yo Wen's high, who is exactly the same kind of warlord and all the others of his of his cousins and brothers, but he depicted himself as one from the flock of the tigers. I guess it's him and his brother. That's yes, the one that was there, that was a good communist as well, supposedly. And uh, this, you know, he has deep devotion to republic uh, republicanism of every sort in China. So elegantly managed to use a bit of elements of modern. Uh, of sculpture addition to a classical art. And it's very interesting, and I'll talk about it. If you look at this villa, it mixes classical Chinese palace with a European villa. So it absolutely mixes different elements, as you see, in a way that is familiar to anybody who likes to visit sites from this period. So obviously, you know, it's very neo-traditional. But at the end, and I'll come back to it, his villa became and saved during Cultural Revolution because it was filled of a gigantic sculpture of the evil warlords. And this is this very large sculpture composition, much larger than this room, showing how warlord he is, surrounded by his cronies, is you know taking from people their wealth, and you see the anger of the righteous masses that they would stand up and do what Mao Zedong said. Not only when you equip them with guns and pubs, then the revolution can happen. So if you have, if any of you harbor any needs for upturning social order, you know, chairman told you that you need a certain tools to up, you know, do it, and then it all works just fine. And so, so Leo's, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, you think then standing Leos of Anren, you know, that was their ancestral ground, they would be very local. Yes, and, you know, these are the Sichuan warlords, the famous Sichuan warlords, the, the guy that came out with a big flag Sichuan for the Sichuanese, you know, they held to their power, they actually managed to kick away many of the officials, specialist merchants and so on, who came from different regions of China in the 1920s, promoting locals for this sort of local nationalism. So here you have finally your nationalist hero. If not a little problem, but one of them was ruling Shikang. And it was equally locally nationalistic to Shikang that, you know, he lived in agreement with local camp uh, warlords, as local warlords, in order to build a local Tibeto Shikangish kind of nationalism that was presided by uh, this Han warlord from the Liu family. So already this argument is being <laughs> somewhere or another damaged. Um, also, Leos have exhibited a great flexibility. They never really cared about localism. Localism only served the other purpose, getting to power. It was a great way to build their, you know, Feng Chung, so the, their fortress land. But it was an amazing way then to enter into the mainstream of Chinese politics. All of them became, you know, avowed nationalists. And Liu Xiang somehow had some accident in 1938 and it didn't work for him. And so, but, you know, Chongqing was too important, but generally, and then they became one of them, at least the only surviving one, became a communist. So it has never been about Sichuan. It has never been localism. It has always been about power. Huh? And every single piece of their projection, and the pro as a family project, is a project of us upstart careerists and not of somebody who represents anything about Sichuan or any other place. Um, also, just looking at them as the local phenomenon, you know, obscures our eyes. I mean, 
which other families of this period were like this? The Jiangs, the ones from the Jiang Jiushi, Chiang Kai Shek. Oh, they're very much upstarts. The Songs, uh, very much intermarried with uh, you know the Song family, and that had so much. The guys like Zhang Zuolin and so on from Manchuria, they weren't like this. The Guanxi League guys weren't like this. All of them have been like, Li Zhongren wasn't like this, like the president of China. You know, all this localism at the end served various games. So it's just a play of multiple identities and using identities by very conscious players in order to get themselves up. Now, what's about the landlordism? I've heard so much about the, you know, the Chinese, the Sichuanese landlordism and Sichuanese warlordism being the most exploitative. You know, you had all the kind of ridiculous figures of, you know, how much taxes they extracted, which they did. But they also in other areas of China at that time, in many other historical periods, different rulers, if they could, did extract as much as they could. And so this figure of the evil landlord plays in the Cultural Revolution, you know, so much has been made of it. It's just because it was so good for the particular campaign. It was such a recognizable figure and it was so easy. And his gigantic villa stood there in the moment of particular campaign. Now, you know, and it's even, uh, so what can you say about them? Really, they were just magnates. As you've seen from me showing you their palaces, they, their style and life was not like this, but was like this. It resembled in all ways and manners. If you travel to places like Taiping in, in Guangdong province, you know, where all the rich Hua Chao overseas Chinese people were building their villas. If you visit China through that perspective, villas in Shanghai and so on, how much have you seen it? It's really a kind of a cosmopolitan class that was using a certain objects, material objects, in order to show their own position. And that position required particular purchases and looks, and they've done it so similar to the guys from Kaiting in their own places where their clan residence was, their own, you know, the, 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 the homeland of the particular family, and not in the place where they really resided, whether it would be Beijing, whether it would be Shanghai, whether it would be Chongqing. Yes? So this is really embellishing, embellishing the place where you live. So after even destroying the Sichuan warlords as a form of localism, uh, let's move to conclusions. I think, what can the provincial history be? Because I, I think I gave you enough proof and examples that provincial history is in trouble. And we cannot obviously just trash all the classical handbook style histories. They're useful. Huh? If you pick your seven volumes of Sichuan history, whatever volume Yunnan history, or whatever other local history, it's useful. It has data. We need them. It's not that they are by themselves evil and that we should never look at them and you should start you know, a little campaign against them. Not so much. I mean, these are handbooks which serve a certain purpose, but they don't belong very much to the tradition of analytical history. And we need to look at them with a large, you know, not a grain of salt, but a truckload of salt, yes? And in order to us to see how this data can then be fed in a much broader analytical network in which we really research what people did. But we obviously cannot have everything in one place. So I think that generally, if you think about any kind of provincial history or history that is more local, um, um, We should first of all look. We should look how people network, even though they're local, and if they're formed locally and they act locally, we should look at the way these people network outside and beyond the administrative uh, networks within they exist. How they interact across the border, and how their life is shaped and not how administrative borders form their lives. So we should turn the picture, not look at the, let's say, I don't know, life in Hubei, but a human who acts from there, yes? So the Hubei shouldn't be a limit by kind of information that provides us with context. We should be very much sensitive to transfer to networks, to contacts, to circulations, and, uh, and the various usages of local environments. And especially, so, we shouldn't think that the environment is the formative easy explanation, but the way people interact with those various elements of their social environmental 
geographical and political context. Because we, if you lose from sight the real action of people within it, we'll just be replicating the history written by administrators or, or some kind of chopped up data that exists within the administration. Um, if we focus on a bigger topic than just people, something like a defined space, a village, a city, a county, or even a whole province, yes, we should not lose from sight the existence of the broader world beyond it, yes, the cities, and also the comparative scales. Yes, we had a moment in writing Chinese history, of writing city history, those Suzhou history, Shanghai history, a lot of Chengdu histories, and so on and so on. The problem is that if you get all this history now side by side, you'd see that very often they just say the same history. And this is where the problems start arising. If they speak about very simple, hi similar histories, then perhaps there's something wrong in writing this kind of history. Maybe this should be a much more interacted history or much more problem-based history. Or maybe this unit as a city does not really help us at all because those units should be very much questioned. Um, if you look at the institutions of social life, such as temples, festivals, rituals, well, even food habit, and we should not give to a false dream of uniqueness. And that uniqueness that very often comes from the wrong mix of uh, anthropology and history. Yes? A wrong mix, what I mean by the wrong mix is that you know you use the anthropological method in order to get a very in-depth study of something, but I'm finishing in one minute. And uh, then I know you're hunting on me. <laughs> but you know, but then at the end we miss the fact that the cult can be, you know, supra-regional. We miss that the cult exists in a various context, or simply that can exist even outside of country because social functions that underline the cult can exist even beyond a particular culture. And that's when we should also ask ourselves: if something what happens in a Chinese temple resembles what something what happens in a Catholic church, maybe we shouldn't pervert the topic what is in this temple, but think about why people perform something and ask a different set of questions to understand what we actually see. Um, so I would say that the province is a provincial history can be a first subject, but it's a subject that requires a lot of context, a subject that requires us to have a very much open eyes about cultural, social, geographic, and political, environmental issues that are connected to it, to it and the one where we should be very much aware that if we look at it, we're not going to find provincialism or we're also not going to suddenly discover the holy grail of unique history that nobody has ever written or something that uh, would give us the sense of pristine localism and then uh, which then might seem as a truer or other view on history. That things typically don't happen as we are social creatures and we always exist in context of Alice. Thank you.